you. Okay, recording started. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, the third day, the last one. Uh, and now our first speaker is um, Jed. Um, so yeah, we, I think um, everyone is here um, and those who will join us in the upcoming five minutes can will still understand what Jed is talking about. So uh, Jed. What's his name? Everybody knows his full name. Jedediah Wilfred Papas Allen. Oh yeah, really full name. <laughs> okay, yeah. When I first arrived in Turkey, I'd get emails to me that would say, Dear Jedediah Wilfred Papas Allen, because they would just cut and paste it from, from somewhere and they didn't know what, what was my actual name. So, um, so uh, before I get started, um, uh, I, uh, as others have done, I want to say thanks to everybody who's um, been part of this, meaning literally everyone, the audience, the the panelists, the, the speakers, um, the organizing committee, uh, and of course, Mark. Um, uh, I sometimes um, wasn't sure if Mark was as excited as we were about the idea of having to be on every panel and, and have to uh, discuss uh, all the different issues, but I think in the end, he definitely will, in, has enjoyed it so far, which is great. Um, I just want to also say um, just really quick about my history with Mark and, and, and sort of a, my own sort of thoughts. Um, uh, I had basically decided not to go to graduate school and kind of serendipitously came across Mark's work um, and that changed my mind. It, it let me think about cognitive science in a way that um, was interesting to me ultimately is what it comes down to, I think, for all of us. Um, and um, now that I'm in academia, I guess, I'm not sure whether to be thankful for that still or not. Um, but, uh, um, uh, some people have said, you know, Mark's the thinker's thinker or the philosopher's philosopher. And I, 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 I actually haven't heard those before. I, I really like that way of talking about it. I think it, it nicely captures the idea of the sort of scope and, and completeness and thoroughness um, with which Mark pursues his own passion um, and or his own interest. Um, and it's that sort of intellectual integrity that I also think can let us say that Mark is the person's person because for those of us who have met him, uh, we know as a person he's quite generous um, um, uh, in spirit. Um, no, you know, he, he, he enjoys talking to you about uh, anything intellectual at whatever levels uh, you can engage with him. And so in that respect, I, I think he's, he's also a, a person's person. Um, and so that, that's my, my thank you to, to Mark and our celebration here today. Um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and get started on my talk. Which... Jed, thanks for saying all that. That was wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, Thank you, too. <laughs> so let me, um, I have slides. I, I'm a classic, um, I guess, more psychology presenter. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, two, basically two studies. Um, and the two studies are, are um, coming from a paper that was published in 2018 and then one that is, you know, got its second round of revisions right now. I need to, to maybe probably submit them next week, so hopefully it'll be published soon. But the idea is that these are two um, interrelated studies about um, an empirical implication of knowing levels um, and hence the, the label for, for my talk today. Uh, Robert, I just want to double check. You can see my slides. Is that right? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All is good. So um, the argument, uh, and uh, by the way, the, the two papers, so Mark and I are the, the co-authors on the um, first paper, and we have a third co-author, Bartu Chalik, who's a um, student of mine here at Bill Kent who's a co-author on the second paper, the second project. And I'll be presenting the, the two projects um, separately because the second one builds on the first one. So the argument um, for, um, even for those of you familiar with Mark's model that um, isn't necessarily highlighted because it's, it's not clear what, wh why you- Yeah, yeah the main, um, it seems like uh, we can hear you sort of like um, not, not strong enough. Hmm. You kind of- Switches. Robert and Ooze, is that a general problem for you or? Yeah, that does everyone feel that way? Because I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, I can hear you. I think those of us in Europe maybe can hear him. <laughs> Shout louder. We want to hear you in China. Yeah. yeah. Wait, are you able to turn <laughs> no, up your volume? Okay, I'll, like I'll, I'll try a little. Closer to the mic or something. 
Hmm. All right, I'll, I'll try teaching style, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so before age four, um, they're, they're, age four is around the time of reflection. And so prior to age four, knowing is interactive. Um, but what that also means is that knowing is restricted to things that can be interacted with in some sort of more direct sense. So things that are less direct, like object properties or relations, can't be directly interacted with. And therefore, at level one knowing, they can't be explicitly known. Um, and we're going to exploit this fact in our empirical study. So um, uh, interactive makes sense of this in terms of the difference between implicit versus explicit knowing. And reflection is the transition from all interactive or implicit knowing or representation to explicit uh, representation. Um, and the second part, which is the focus of the second study, the second paper is to rule out um, other ways of thinking about what might be changing around age four in development, because Mark isn't the only person to suggest that something in development is changing at around age four. And in general, these are executive functioning abilities, um, inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. So that's the basic argument. Um, the outline for the talk is to suggest there is an age four transition empirically, at least descriptively, to introduce um, Mark's model or relevant aspects of the model, and then to present the um, empirical test of the model. Um, this is then followed by the second part, which is to replicate, we, we talked about this yesterday with Robert, uh, to replicate the basic finding. Um, and in doing so, try to extend it a little bit with some new tasks and um, rule out uh, alternative ways of thinking about what might be going on around age four. If we have time, I'll mention the implications for social cognition and um, object uh, reasoning. So I'm also gonna keep time just so I have it. So guys, I have myself starting at five after, but um, feel free to let me know, Robert, when I'm running out of time. Um, so the basic point here is just to suggest there, there seems descriptively when you look across um, the literature to be a number of transitions. Maybe they're qualitative. Again, this is just descriptive at this level um, that seem to take place in things as diverse as perspective taking, which is, you know, do you see what I see? Executive functions, which are your ability to uh, monitor and control your actions in accordance with your goals various aspects of language, uh, whether it's um, understanding that two names can both, uh, that an that a object can have two different names like a bird or a robin, um, but as well as changes in syntax and other aspects of language. Um, autobiographical memory, uh, remembering yourself in episodes, but explicitly having a sense of self in those episodes, that's the auto um, part, I guess. Um, something called trust research, this is just, um, being able to adapt who you learn from in different situations. Um, so I'm gonna learn from the doctor in medical situations and I'll learn from the car mechanic in um, car situations. Um, and then also counterfactual and what's been called future thinking, uh, projecting into the future and so on. Um, and of course, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that there seems to be some pretty important developments going on in theory of mind research. Uh, theory of mind abilities, and especially um, false belief understanding. Um, and it's the false belief understanding that we actually take as our starting point, because the, the project here is to try to argue for a domain general shift around age four. And to do this, I'm taking the methodology of Zalazo, uh, who's a, a famous um, person for um, executive functions, or Joseph Perner, um, I'm taking their methodology and basically what it is is to um, demonstrate that your task that you think is responsible for the developments is related to other domains. And so the other domain that people have been focused on is, is theory of mind or social cognition and in particular false belief tasks. So um, false belief tasks um, are all measuring children's ability to understand that uh, other people might have beliefs about the world that are incorrect. Now, if the child knows they're incorrect, the child's belief about the world will be different. So I might know that the chocolate is in the fridge. And I might also know that you believe falsely the chocolate's in the cupboard. 
And I will understand that because of your false belief, you will act incorrectly in order to achieve the chocolate. That's the basic, uh, sorry, this is the marble one. This is um, substitute marble for chocolate. Um, and so it seems like children um, can't differentiate explicitly anyways, their perspective from that of others. And so they fail a task. They answer with, in accordance with what they know rather than in accordance with what you falsely believe. Um, and there's a bunch of different varieties, but that's, uh, this one's called change of location. Um, and um, as I uh, mentioned a minute ago, um, people have proposals for what is going on in um, theory of mind or false belief understanding to account for the change from about three years to four years. And some of those accounts, the ones I'm focused on here, are domain general, meaning they don't think whatever's going on for false belief understanding is specific to false belief understanding. They think it's a more general change that allows false belief understanding, maybe also perspective taking or executive functioning. Um, and so Perner has his own tasks um, that he's using to try to illustrate this idea of meta representation. For him, until you can represent representations, you can't think about other people's false representations and so on. I'm not gonna get into the details of these guys because I wanna present our, our uh, thoughts on this, but it's, it's, the, it's the same basic um, approach. And for Zelazo, the idea was to develop a task that measured um, cognitive flexibility. This is being able to switch what you're doing in accordance with your goals. Um, and for him, the reason he, he had that task is because it's this um, new capacity for embedded rules that develops around age four, allows you to pass things like false belief, allows you to engage in this cognitive flexibility. And he had a physical reasoning task as well. Um, and so what they found was, and there's others, um, Heinous Ricosi has, has done a study similar to this, um, but the basic point is um, they find that there are correlations between the tasks from very different domains. And they find it both before and after controlling for things like language and age, and they think that therefore shows a domain general transition, and it's either for Zelazo a executive functioning transition or for Perner, a meta-representational transition. For us, it's going to be a reflection transition. Um, all right. So um, to explain what it means for there to be a reflection transition, I'm going to review a little bit of uh, interactivism. Um, interactivism isn't, for, for those who are less familiar with it, is an action-based approach, which just means that knowing is doing. Um, and um, the idea is that uh, children, young children before age four, have explicit knowledge. It's just that it's knowledge about activity, what could be done in situations. Um, and this is very different than the knowing about the world. Uh, for those of you who um, um, have been here for the whole conference or are more familiar with Mark's work, we know that I'm um, I'm drawing a contrast between epistemic contact and epistemic content, which I'm going to go into in more detail. Um, but really the key here is the idea of implicit presupposition. And I think this has actually been a little bit misunderstood in some of the talks, perhaps. So it may uh, clear up a little bit here. And it's essential in order to understand the leaning blocks task. The leaning blocks task is the task to measure reflection at age four. So implicit presupposition is the key here. It gives us a way to think about implicit knowing um, and then we apply it to object representation. What does it mean to implicitly know objects? Um, and in order to make sense of that, we need to understand a little bit about interactivist model of knowing levels and this idea of reflection. So the basic model of representation um, at its core has the idea of anticipation. So that's the, the mental part of the actions. Um, all action-based approaches think that knowing is doing, um, but this is going a step further in providing the, the sort of um, internal organism part of that, and that's the anticipations. Um, and anticipations are argued to have um, both truth value and aboutness. Um, they have truth value in that they can be correct or incorrect, and they have aboutness in terms of um, the presuppositions, and that will come on our next slide. Um, I'm actually not going to go into this in more detail because I don't think I need to. Um, so what are implicit presuppositions? Implicit presuppositions are assumptions 
about the environment that relate to the indication or the anticipation. So the idea is if I have an anticipation that I can kick the can, that implicitly presupposes that the can isn't filled with paint. Well, let's hope it does, otherwise I'm a masochist. Um, but it also presupposes that the ground is not made of ice. Um, and part of, I think, the trick with implicit presupposition is understanding that it's implicitly defined, meaning the environmental conditions aren't known by the indicating organism. And so this has come up when we've talked about um, frogs and the, the classic discussion of flies and pebbles and all the rest of it. Um, and I think Marcin talked about meteors um, hitting the earth. Um, meteors not hitting the earth, I think, is part of the implicit presupposition that I can flick my tongue and eat. Um, the point is that the environmental conditions aren't specified as particulars. They're not exhausted either. Um, it's an unbounded class. And so all the implicit presupposition does is to say, the conditions in the environment are appropriate for what I have indicated as a possible interaction. And if the interaction fails, something about the presuppositions were incorrect. Maybe I have the capacity to, to, to uh, know what it is and therefore detect, um, well, maybe I have the capacity to detect error in my anticipation failing and maybe I have the capacity to know what it is that makes me an error, but I don't need to. And so again, this goes back to the sense in which um, presuppositions are implicitly, I don't know if definitional is a proper English, but implicitly definitional. Um, okay, so the reason this is um, important and powerful is because it gives us a way to think about implicit knowing. There's a lot of discussion right now, for those of you who are familiar in theory of mind, about implicit versus explicit theory of mind knowing. And I don't think it gets very far a lot of the times because there aren't very many theoretical resources to make sense of this idea of implicit knowing. Um, and part of that can be because people don't have an action-based perspective. So Karmeloff Smith tried to talk about implicit knowing and Fodor came back and said, well, what you call implicit is still explicit about something. And that's true if we're talking about uh, encoded representations. It's not true if we're talking about action-based representations. Um, and so um, I think a lot of researchers want there to be something like implicit knowing because it seems to make sense of a lot of um, infant behavior where the infant seems to be acting in accordance with certain knowledge, but they're so young, we're not sure they have that knowledge. Um, and so when you take this to the extreme, you argue for a nativist position. You say infants act in accordance with what we call the principle of persistence or the principle of solidity or the principle of um, uh, some other physical feature, and therefore they have knowledge about it. That's why they act in accordance with it. Um, but implicit presupposition as implicit knowing gives us a way out of that, um, I don't know, um, that potential difficulty, i.e. of infants having knowledge that, seeming to have knowledge that maybe we don't think they should have for other reasons. Um, okay, and so this applies to a lot of infant research, object, permanence, number, false belief, and so on. That's not the focus today. The focus today is to convince you that um, um, uh, interactive knowing levels and reflection is a good candidate for explaining what happens at age four. And so how do we do that? Well, we're gonna focus on objects. So Piaget argued that objects are interactively known. So he had an action-based approach to object representation. And Mark has indicated um, uh, that he borrows um, a lot of Piaget's thinking on this, integrating it into um, his vocabulary and so on. Um, and for Piaget, object representation took a couple years. So at, at around two years of age, they had the, the full object concept um, or representation capabilities. Um, but from this perspective, um, um, oh, sorry. And so what that means is for Piaget, um, object permanence was not sort of intuitively out of sight, out of mind understanding or something like that. Um, instead, the reason it took two years is because children were progressively 
learning to differentiate their own activity from the world. And so object permanence is actually a self world differentiation that seems to culminate in some important capabilities at around age two. Um, and the, any knowledge about object permanence at age two though, is implicit in that differentiation. And so this is where um, uh, interactivism is actually gonna diverge from Piaget and theory on this, um, because it's not gonna be till age four with the development of reflection that children are gonna be capable of knowing explicitly about the presuppositions of objects um, and their properties, et cetera. All right. Um, so the last step in presenting you with some aspects of interactivism is to talk about knowing levels and reflection. I've alluded to it a few times. Um, this is the key to uh, explaining how implicit knowing and those, uh, those implicit presuppositions can ever become explicit. Again, from this perspective, not until age four is it possible. Um, and also to begin to um, uh, think about how to know things that aren't directly, that you can't interact with directly. So Mark has mentioned this previously in terms of abstract knowledge, more abstract knowledge like number. Threeness isn't out in the world. How can you interact with threeness? Well, you can't directly, um, and therefore some further account is needed to explain how we come to know about things like numbers. Um, so the first knowing level is interactive knowing. This is um, mostly what's been talked about and gets talked about in the interactivist model when we talk about representation as anticipation, stuff like that. Um, and from this perspective, uh, something like object permanence is a presupposition of the web of anticipations that the two-year-old has. So the two-year-old has some complex organization, internal organization with certain features, reachability being one of the features Mark's mentioned. Um, and permanence is a property of that organization. It's not known by that organization. Therefore, it's not known by the organism. And it's not until age four that you could potentially come to know it. And so what this means is that with reflection, you can come to explicitly represent the presuppositions of level one knowing. And when you can come to explicitly represent the presuppositions of level one knowing, you can come to explicitly represent object properties and their relations. And so the key to this task is to differentiate between children who are only capable of reasoning about objects in terms of um, interactive knowing such that properties and relations are implicit versus children who are able to explicitly represent them. And so this task was actually developed by Mark some time ago. It's not trivial to figure, figure out how to do this, um, but it's only been tested um, much more recently or tested and published much more recently. Um, so that, that's the, the, the task, um, to differentiate between children who only know interactively and therefore um, uh, their knowledge of relations and properties will be implicit in the presuppositions versus children who are able to explicitly reason about those properties and or relations. I'll get into what the task is exactly in the methods section. Um, I've already um, explained the logic of this study. It's based on the logic of other people like Joseph Perner and uh, Phil Zalazzo. Um, so uh, research questions, does object reasoning involve an age four transition? Um, this is something that should sound quite um, unusual. Um, again, a lot of people are happy to think that object uh, representation anyways is innate or even the most extreme developmentalist will think it maybe develops at around age two to suggest that there's something um, more here at age four is actually quite um, unusual. Um, we'll then quickly look at whether the task, the leaning blocks task might be an earlier example of the age four transition. And another way of saying this is that the leaning blocks task, whether it's a, a more sort of a, a pure measure of reflection all tasks involve all sorts of abilities. 
um, but some of them have a lot more noise than others. So false belief tasks, part of the criticism of them is that they involve a lot of uh, narrative capabilities, a lot of language capability, a lot of inhibitory demands and so on. So this question too, another way of saying this is, is does the leaning blocks task have very few extraneous performance factors relative to the um, reflection competence that it's measuring. Um, okay, and then what is the relation between um, leaning blocks and false belief? Robert, can I get a time? I, I'm at 25 minutes if I got uh, it. You still have 20 minutes to go. 20 minutes, okay. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, method, we had you know children, preschoolers. Uh, we had three false belief tasks, but we combined them. So um, we'll, we'll focus on the total. For the leaning blocks task, um, here, here's how it works. Uh, you hold up a block on an angle, 45 degree angle, and you ask the child, when I let go, what will happen? Will it fall or stay up? Um, and the child answers, and um, presumably all children will say it will fall. You do the same thing with a block on the opposite side, and then comes the test question. And the test question says, when I let go of the blocks, will they fall or stay up? And for your eye looking at this, it's trivial the blocks will lean against each other and be mutually supportive. Um, but for the um, interactive knowing child, the pre-age, uh, the, sorry, the age four pre-reflective child, um, it's not uh, trivial. And so this was done with three different materials just to vary the materials to see if it had any effect. Uh, big blocks, two big pieces of cardboard, two very small blocks. Um, and then the false belief task, there was three of them. I'm not gonna go into it. We can talk about it later. Um, they all just measure false belief in different ways. The results. So the first question was just to see whether there would be a transition around age four. Um, and so the idea here is from the interactive perspective, it's predicted that children, three-year-olds will fail to answer the leaning blocks question correctly. Um, and so let's see our results. The results are laid out this way because there was three versions, right? There was big blocks, small blocks, and cardboard. So you can have a score from zero to three. And what you get here is um, most of the three-year-olds um, did poorly. Uh, whereas most of the four and five-year-olds, actually a, a vast majority of them, uh, did quite well. And so when we look at false belief performance of the same ages, we see a slightly different pattern in which the three-year-olds do quite poorly, the five-year-olds do quite well, and the four-year-olds are somewhere in between. And this maps on to standard findings in the literature. We're arguing with a relatively pure measure of reflection, we get more of a threshold effect. Um, whereas a lot of the transitions, because they have all these additional abilities required, involve more of a, a continuous transition. So this is, is um, fairly um, common, what I'm trying to say. Um, we then collapsed um, the scoring into pass-fail. So zero on is fail, two, three is pass. And we compare false belief with leaning blocks because our assumption is leaning blocks has fewer additional abilities required and therefore it's an easier task and a more pure measure of reflection. Um, false belief understanding tasks, they aren't, they aren't really a measure of reflection at all, not directly. But the idea is that reflection is why children can pass them as an enabling. And we're gonna to get to that a little bit more in the conclusion, our discussion. Um, and so when you look at this, we see, yes, um, if children fail leaning blocks, they don't pass false belief. But if they pass false belief, sorry, if they pass leaning blocks, they may or may not pass false belief. And that's because there's all sorts of additional abilities required for false belief understanding uh, beyond reflection, like narrative comprehension, language, uh, Etc. cetera. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this. It's just to follow up on the relationships. The basic point is to say um, this last correlation here, the point, if I have my cursor, this 0.16. The idea is after we control for age, so before controlling for age, false belief, understanding, and leaning blocks are correlated. But after we, we remove, move the variants um, uh, associated with age, they're not correlated. And we, like Zalazo, <laughs> interpret this as um, 
uh, indicating that we've removed the effect of development. And when you do that, we no longer have the correlation. This is actually an issue that I wouldn't mind discussing with people if they have thoughts, but you need to have some statistical sophistication, I think, which I, I don't have so much. Um, and so that's why it'd be nice to talk about. So that's the, the basic results. So the conclusion here is um, uh, we, we, similar to others, we think there's a domain general shift that explains all sorts of transitions. Um, unlike others, we're using our own particular task. It's an unusual task because it's in the object representation domain and that shouldn't really have any further developments, interesting developments going on at age four. Um, and we think the fact that it's correlated prior to controlling for age, but not after indicates that it's, it's a more pure measure of, and the other findings, it's a more pure measure of um, reflection. Um, the, the support for the interactors model here isn't by testing alternatives. We talked about this yesterday with Robert, right? So much as it's testing uh, a prediction that is difficult to explain from other perspectives. Um, it's difficult to think about why um, changes in, in um, cognitive flexibility, embedded rules, if you're Zalazo, would allow you to pass this task at age four, but fail it at age three. So I think part of the power of this initial test is simply in the prediction. Um, as I said to you guys a minute ago, even people open to an action-based approach would think that around age two, you are representing objects explicitly. So that, that's the power of this uh, empirical test. The, the, the conclusion is, you know, let's get back to stages maybe, the idea that there's different forms of knowing and you need some sort of reflection process in order to transition. So this is an allusion to, to Piaget a little bit. Um, but um, um, the idea of the second study is to do more direct tests of alternative interpretations. So I started this off by saying, there's lots of transitions that happen. There's, a, a, I'm on, it's a minority of people, but there's a group of people arguing for domain general changes. The most obvious one is executive functioning. And so in study two, what we're going to do is try to test for the executive functioning interpretation of leaning blocks versus the reflection interpretation. And we're going to try to rule out the executive functioning one, thereby leaving the reflection interpretation. And again, I'm just laying it out this way because of how we talked about things yesterday in Robert's um, presentation. So the purpose of study two is to um, replicate, replicate first, by the way, the findings of leaning blocks. Try to design um, one task that would be um, the, the, very much the same as leading blocks, a second task that's an extension based on Piaget's discussion of anticipatory imagery, um, and then to try to rule out an alternative interpretation in terms of executive functioning for the age four transition. So again, we had um, around the same number of children that was on purpose. Um, and this time though, we had three reflection tasks, three tasks that we thought would be um, more closely just measuring reflection with very few extraneous sort of performance factors um, and three classic executive functioning tasks. Um, and everyone got the, the tasks in the same order. Uh, we've already done leaning blocks. I'm not gonna go into this one because we're short on time. I'm just gonna tell you that the idea here is that this is the same as the leaning blocks task. Um, in Piaget's terminology, we would call both this task and the leaning blocks task um, kinetic anticipatory imagery tasks. And this is in contrast to these Piagetian tasks that are supposed to be transformational anticipatory imagery tasks. Don't worry about the, the, the background in, of Piaget's characterization here. The point is, Candy monster and leaning blocks are the same type of reflection task. The elastic bands task is actually a different type of reflection task. Further, we adapted it. Piaget used this with older children, um, five, six, seven-year-olds. Um, we adapted it for preschool, which meant we provided children with possible answers. So what you see in this task is there's an elastic band wrapped around these four pegs. And the one peg task is we remove one peg. Oh, sorry, we don't remove. We tell the child we're gonna re remove one peg. And when we remove it, what will the shape look like? We give them familiarization and warm up and all the rest of it. Um, and you have your options down here. So if I remove 
this peg, the top right, of course, all of us can quickly do the transformation and it turns into this triangle. So that's the elastic band task. There was two versions of it um, that actually behave quite differently. We thought they would just be you know, increasing difficulty. Um, the second one, I, I put my fingers actually on two of them and I say, if I remove these two pegs, what will the shape look like? What will the elastic band look like? And of course, if I remove these two pegs, the elastic band will look like this. Okay, so that's the elastic band task, two, two um, versions of it. Day night stroop is about uh, inhibitory control. I hold up a card to the child and I say, we're gonna play a game. When I show you sun, you say moon. And when I show, no, when I show you um, the sun, you say night. And when I show you the moon, you say day. This is hard on my working memory and my inhibitory control. Um, it, it's a standard task that's been used for a long time. Uh, for working memory, we adapted. Um, we actually had to create our own task because classic backward digit span is too difficult for three-year-olds. So classic backward digit span is uh, repeat back to me this sequence, one, three, four, but do it in the reverse order. Mm. So if I say one, three, four, you would say back four, three, one. That's backward digit span. Again, this is a classic um, working memory task, but that version is too difficult. So we replaced the number sequencing with balloons in a container. So we put the green one, the yellow one, the white one. And we asked the child, which one will come out first, second, third? Um, nine minutes. Nine minutes, okay. Then we had uh, cognitive flexibility. This is a, a standard uh, task for being able to switch what you're doing in accordance with your goals. So we have children sort according to color and then we switch it and have them sort according to shape. And then we even switch back and forth and kids before age four have difficulty. Even at age four, they have some difficulty. Um, okay, so research questions. Does leaning blocks replicate? How does it relate to the new reflection tasks? And what's the relationship with executive functioning? Here's a descriptive uh, mapping uh, the Y axis is a, um, a standardized because these are all on different scales. But what you see here is leading blocks has a fairly clear age four transition. At least um, when we look at children grouped according to age three versus four and five year olds. The candy monster task has a very similar age four transition. You have threes versus four and fives. For the working memory task, you're getting a little bit more continuous development for executive functioning, the same thing. For this task, the same thing. For these two, you're getting more of an age five transition. At least this one, you're getting an age five transition. So um, elastic bands task, I'll just tell you now, it didn't exactly work the way we thought it was gonna work for many reasons. So I'm not gonna talk about elastic band results since we're short on time. Um, all right. I guess I didn't need my cursor. Um, to further test the idea that there is, um, there is in fact more of a threshold effect here, um, we didn't group the kids according to three, four, and five and look for group differences. We just plotted them according to age and months and their score. And then we ran an analysis which basically looks for a cut point where you're gonna change the slope of the regression. And this is done like statistically. And the cut point that the, the statistical analysis came up with was 46 and a half months. So 48 months is age four. So this is sort of a more data driven way of saying that there's an age four transition that has um, something closer to a threshold effect rather than a continuous development. So before controlling for age, many things are correlated with each other. Here's leaning blocks and it's correlated with basically everything except the working memory task. But we're really interested in um, looking at what happens after we control for age. And what we see is that the three executive functioning tasks are no longer correlated. We interpret that to mean that they are not responsible for the age four transition that accounts for leaning blocks. In contrast, we see a correlation with Candy Monster that continues after controlling for age. And we interpret that as a consequence of both Candy Monster and leaning blocks being relatively pure measures of reflection. One additional 
way to try to um, test whether executive functioning is responsible for the leaning block performance is to, um, to um, look at the correlation between our reflection tasks. And again, I just wanna focus on candy monster and leaning blocks right now. So this is the correlation between uh, leaning blocks and candy monster, the two reflection tasks, the two pure reflection tasks after we control for executive functioning. And the two remain correlated. So this is another sort of indirect way of us trying to test whether executive functioning is responsible for um, leading blocks performance or whether it is in fact reflection. So our aims were to replicate and extend the findings from the original study um, but also in this case to try to rule out alternative interpretations for what might be going on at age four, because Perner has been arguing since the 90s that it's meta representation. So Lazo has been arguing since the 90s that it's executive functioning, um, et cetera. So it's important to, to at least do some testing of this empirically. Um, we think the replication is pretty robust. We think it's robust because it's a different sample. It's a Turkish sample, so it's a different culture. Um, we did other things that I'm not gonna get into to try to make it a robust replication. Um, as far as extension goes, um, yeah, partially. The extension partially worked and it partially didn't. So it worked with respect to the same type of reflection task. It didn't work with a um, new type of reflection task. As far as ruling out alternative explanations, um, we couldn't find any evidence that executive functioning is responsible for the variability we see in leaning blocks. And therefore we conclude that those are not, or, or we've ruled them out as possibilities for explaining the age four transition. Um, a quick note though, part of the difficulty of uh, the empirical side of this and the statistical side is that reflection is an enabling constraint. It's not an ability per se. Um, and because it's an enabling constraint, we, we expect the threshold effect where you, you have a transition, something much more like a sort of a, um, I can't remember the name of the function, but a, a threshold function where people generally fail before the transition and they generally pass after the transition. That's a little bit different than a lot of these other uh, age four transition tasks because they're, they're generally more continuous. Um, and what I wanna say is, um, because it's enabling constraint, the statistical relationships I think are a little bit difficult to figure out. Um, but because it's an enabling constraint um, that is supposed to be responsible for the other transitions, it suggests a rethinking of those other transitions, especially executive functioning. So executive functioning is typically thought of in an information processing terms. You have this domain general ability and you can apply it to any particular contents you want. From this perspective, if reflection, according to interactivism, is actually what's developing around age four, then in some sense, reflection has to be responsible for executive functioning, by the way. But the way it's responsible isn't in terms of it being the ability, it's responsible in terms of it enabling new abilities. And the enabling is going to be content specific. Meaning I don't develop domain general executive functioning and then apply it to pick the contents. I develop the ability to do particular things that have the executive functioning property. And this way of rethinking executive functioning is actually consistent with some recent proposals. The second one's by a downical systems person. And the first one is, um, I'm not sure their background actually, but where they're trying to suggest there's more of a sort of, um, this is like um, Tomasello's point with language. You don't learn the abstract grammatical structure, you don't uh, yeah, learn the abstract grammatical structure and apply it to particular verbs. Instead, you learn how to use particular verbs with that abstract grammatical structure. And so what I'm suggesting is that the findings here and the conclusion that reflection according to interactivism is what develops, lends itself to a rethink of executive functioning along the same lines. What's the time, Robert? One and a half minutes. One and a Perfect. half. Perfect. I only have eight slides left. So um, I'm just going to wrap it together and, and give you the sort of the, the general conclusions. The, the, the first conclusion is 
Um, even if there is an alternative explanation for, um, for leaning blocks that we haven't tested yet, uh, one advantage that interactivism has is its scope. Um, uh, I have this sort of um, little um, way of saying it. Um, interactivism has models from everything from perception to language to motivation, et cetera, um, or you know, the catchy way of saying it, models from normative phenomena to neurons to neighborhoods. Um, and so uh, all things being equal, um, uh, something like uh, executive functioning explanation isn't gonna have the same scope as interactivism. So that's one, one conclusion from this. Um, the other conclusion is I think the, the theoretical machinery is unique in terms of thinking about implicit content and how you get from implicit to explicit and what it means to implicitly know things as an infant and so on. Um, and people have been trying to capture a lot of that because it, it, it seems like it's out there in the world to be captured, um, but they don't have the, the theoretical resources to do it adequately. And mostly this comes down to having a model of representation that allows for it. Because even when we talk about system one versus system two or declarative versus um, uh, procedural, um, as Fodor says, the content of the knowing is still explicit. What changes here is usually the operations. So system one is fast and system two is slow. System one is automatic, system two is deliberative and, and on and on. And so they're, and I think they're capturing real features of these systems, but that's not a model of implicit knowing. That's in a model of different types of processes. And for some reason we call one implicit and the other explicit. Um, and so I think the, the interactive model in terms of its theoretical resources has a lot of potential to help make sense of a number of different areas where people are after something like implicit knowing, but don't really seem to have a model of implicit representation and therefore get stuck in either becoming a nativist and saying, yeah, it's all there, or trying to develop a systems approach, uh, system one, system two, procedural, declarative, something like that, but it, it doesn't quite work, I would suggest. And so in providing some empirical support for this idea of reflection, we, I think, also provide some warrant for using the interactivist model as a theoretical resource for other debates in things like theory of mind and so on. So um, I'm not gonna say any more except thank you to my co-authors, um, my co-director of the Bilgi Lab, our research assistants, parents and children, et cetera. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you, Jed. Um, time for questions. Lucas. Yeah, Jed, that was really nice. I've got, I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I've, I've got a question about why I think that your task involves reflection. So why, why not think that you could solve this task by, in some sense, interactive level one knowledge, interactive knowing of <coughs> object pairs rather than individual objects? And, and you might think that there is a kind of brute way of doing this. And so, for example, chimpanzees, it takes them many years, but they learn about which sort of stone is required to open nuts. And it takes them a really long term time to learn this. But you might think there what you've got is something like level one knowledge of something like object pairs. And so couldn't, couldn't the child be solving that by learning the affordances of object pairs um, in a way that doesn't involve level two knowing? And then why it takes so long is it just, you need just much more time to learn about affordances of object pairs. So um, the short answer is yes. Um, but not in the way you think, perhaps. I don't know. Um, I, I'll give an answer, by the way, and then Mark can follow up, perhaps, because he, he actually developed the task. So, um, Lucas, the answer is yes. You can Anything you can learn with reflection, any procedure, you can learn without reflection with enough, um, uh, with a le enough learning. And so part of what's left out of a lot of discussions on tasks around age four is the, the novelty aspect. And so it's important that the task is sufficiently novel, because if it's not, then what you, what you just said could be the case. Because in principle, anything learnable with reflection is learnable without reflection, any procedure. Um, and so that's, that's um, my response. Mark, did you want to add something to that? 
just to elaborate on that, I, I don't know how much it actually adds, but but yeah, this came up um, when I was working on my dissertation a long, long time ago. Um, and I had this model uh, that I was expressing in terms of abstract machines and Turing machines. And it uh, suggested something like these levels. Um, so the question was, is there actually any organism that realizes these knowing levels at all beyond, beyond knowing level one? And the model itself couldn't tell me that. Uh, it, it, it's in effect an empirical question. Um, are there any level two or more uh, beings on, on Earth? And it would seem sort of obvious that we are, but it's not obvious exactly how to test it. So I was trying to figure this out. I was reading all kinds of places. One of the quote obvious examples might be um, uh, imagery, because imagery calls up this, this sense of a homunculus looking at the image. Uh, it turns out Piaget differentiated at least three different kinds of imagery. And one of his basic kinds of imagery uh, seemed to me to not require a second level at all. Um, he called it reproductive imagery. And I, I won't get into why I thought, well, it's actually fairly simple, but anyway, it seemed obvious to me that what he called reproductive imagery did not require reflection. On the other hand, he also had this, this notion of anticipatory imagery. Um, and it looked to me, I could not figure out any level one way of doing anticipatory imagery um, in, in the sense that Jed was talking about, it, if it's a novel kind of phenomenon. So that was the source of my original pinning this to age four. And then it turns out, as Jed was pointing out, there are age four transitions all over the place and all of them seem to be able to be accounted for. Now, let me rehearse one other part of what Jed said. Um, any finite behavior can be modeled and therefore could be learned in principle with enough learning by a, an abstract machine. You don't even need Turing machine for, for, for any finite uh, behavior if you've learned it enough. And this kind of stuff, I'm, so with respect to the leaning blocks, if you gave a three-year-old a whole bunch of experience with leaning blocks, uh, I'm sure they could give you the right answer, uh, but they wouldn't be able to figure out the right answer, or at least that's the argument. Um, and, and so I took the leaning, well, wh what I was trying to do was to figure out another task that seemed to absolutely require, at least in the novel case, um, reflection. And I don't remember where the idea of using blocks actually came from, but the general logic of the reasoning was a level one toddler interacts with the world, as Jed said, presupposing permanence of blocks and, and other kinds of objects, but it's a presupposition. The blocks per se, qua or qua block, is not being represented. Um, this is one of the problems that shows up when you make this implicit, explicit, when presuppositional distinction, contact, content, distinction. Our vo normal vocabulary equates the two. So it, it's a little bit difficult to talk about the, the kid having an object permanence um, cognition at age two, but not being able to think about objects until age four. Uh, so the distinction turns on this implicit, uh, explicit distinction. And so yeah, Lucas, you're you're quite right. If if you if you gave a three year old enough experience with blocks, I think they could learn to give the answer, but they wouldn't. So the claim is be able to figure it out. When and it's I'll, not. Just throw, I'll just throw something in quick. Um, the uh, the the fact that the so the candy monster is is actually built more on Piaget's anticipatory imagery, his original task or at least as explained to me by Mark, because me and Bartu could, searched through his books and couldn't find it. Um, but the great part is that um, uh, it's so different in terms of its like particulars. I know I didn't explain it to you guys, um, but leaning blocks and candy monster and their particulars and like what you have to do, they're so different. And so the fact that 
both of them stay correlated even after controlling for all these things, I think is, is a pretty robust finding or a pretty powerful finding. I just want to add that. Okay, uh, Johanna. Um, this is uh, a question again from 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 you know the non-specialist, somebody who's observing simply. Um, are you familiar with the research by Hannes Rakoshi, um, who got very famous by showing that um, already kids at the age of two and three are uh, capable of. Um, not only following norms, but criticizing norms, protesting um, uh, to norm violations, and do that not only in, a, in an actual context, but also in a fictional context. So joint pretense games, where somebody says, okay, look, holding a stone, this is the soap I'm gonna wash myself with now. And then the kid continues treating the stone as though it is the soap, which um, if it's a correct uh, continuation of the game would, as I naively think, require that there are some object representations going on there. Or am I seeing this completely wrongly? Um, I mean, look, from our perspective, we're gonna have to think about the sense in which whatever the kids are doing whatever you know, explicit object knowledge is, is actually just being presupposed. Um, I, I actually thought you were going in a slightly different direction when you talked about the norm stuff. Um, and that's, that's it, you know, where language, I, and you know, Mark can follow up on this, but when like, I sometimes have difficulty thinking about whether language is able to kind of like artificially scaffold you into reflective capabilities because of the nature of language. Um, so I, I think the, the object representation part, I actually think wouldn't be, I, I'm guessing we would be able to say, no, you're just presupposing whatever object characteristic you think is explicitly represented, or you haven't demonstrated that you're not just presupposing it. Um, but the other part related to how language gets used, I, I, I kind of feel like, yeah, the best way I can put it is that it scaffolds what are actually reflective capabilities. Um, so I know that's not a direct answer, but um, it's the best I have, I think. Okay, I, I can offer a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> Piaget's reproductive imagery is illustrated by asking a kid to uh, draw his or her house. And they can do that much younger. Um, my demonstration, quote unquote, that that doesn't require reflection would be uh, something like the following. Suppose you have a little robot that can run around a room and it never bumps into anything. The program makes it stop or turn or back up or whatever, uh, just about as it's to run into something, but before it actually does. So clearly in the program, there is information representation in some classical sense that I would disagree with. But anyway, there, there is in some sense control theoretic information about the organization and the structure of the room. Let's now suppose we take the signals that would go to the wheels on this robot and instead send them to some uh, motor controlling a pen. That shift of the context in which those control signals occur could now allow uh, the drawing of the outline of the structure uh, of the room. So now you've got reproductive imagery, but you've got reproductive imagery without any reflection. It's just, it's just a contextually different way of interacting. Now, Piaget had notions of things occurring much earlier, like um, uh, one of his daughters using um, an eraser to pre pretend the eraser is a snail and moving it around like a snail. So I would take that to be sort of an example uh, of, of what you're referring to. And again, uh, you know, I had to think about this. Uh, it, it is a good challenge, but it seems to me that really all it requires is some sort of a shift of interactive context. It, it doesn't necessarily require reflection. Sorry, can I have one more back? The, the interesting bit is that the, the normative let's call it awareness of the kids, uh, as it is practically demonstrated in protesting or not protesting against norm violation, is actually context um, 
as it, 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 it sort of shifts from context to context. So if within a certain game, as the game is set up, the puppet makes a mistake and suddenly breaks a rule, there's a protest. But if a new game is set up, the same action with different rules, the same action is not protested. So that, that shift um, is, from my point of view, that, that goes beyond that. But again, well, well, maybe I'm just sort of pointing well, at well, it. Right? Well, I, I can well, put it in. For, okay, we, sorry, we are cutting into the break already. Uh, okay. So maybe we should allow Eleni uh, to ask the, her question and uh, maybe continue through the break, but we'll see. Okay. So Eleni. Okay. Thank you, that, that was a great talk. I just want to clarify something. The, these false belief tasks, if they are non-verbal, they are passed at around the age of two, and even they are passed by apes and other, uh, other animals. So uh, what happens in humans, in Western societies, in Western languages at around the age of four is that children become capable of syntactic embedding of uh, structures like X believes that Y. So one explanation of why they are able to verbalize what they can do at age two, just by noticing their gaze and measuring where the gaze shifts when they, they have a belief about something that another person has a belief about is that it's the capability of, the lingui of their language to now embed these propositions inside propositions. So it, it probably, it might, and because it's culture dependent, not all cultures uh, display this uh, age four transition, it's much more likely to be related not to some cognitive reflective cap capability, but some linguistic ability. And I was wondering whether you have anything to say about that. Well, so we, empirically, we don't know. Uh, we have two cultures um, that are probably interestingly different in some respects, but maybe not in others. Um, so, but as far as, um, so I, I think what you said about language might be quite right, but I don't think that actually undermines um, what we want to say, which is um, there's an enabling that happens with reflection. So language is going to be, and is, so prior to reflection, language is a powerful tool for all sorts of capabilities. And it's, but the thing is, it, it, the idea would be that you can use it in new ways with reflection, but it doesn't give you any of those new ways. It's just an enabling. Um, and what I'll add is that what I like about the, the, uh, the leaning blocks task is it's so simple. Uh, even the language demands are really simple. The candy monster has a little bit more com complex. We have to do a little familiarization with the kid and so on. Um, and so I, I don't know how you would explain. So we would expect leaning blocks to be relatively universal perhaps to the species, I don't know. Um, but um, it, it's not clear why language is relevant to that task. Um, because, yeah, okay. So because, because the, fa the false belief task can be passed much earlier as long as the child has, does not have to explain verbally so, what they're doing. So maybe if you did the leaning blocks task in a non-verbal manner, so if you put the two blocks together, let's say, and instead of, uh, of one supporting the other, they fall down and the child looks surprised, then you will have a non-verbal indication that this is, cognitively, this is not something that the children are not able to do. So, it's so a lady, what, what I can add is that, yes, it requires a reinterpretation of a lot of, a lot of research. Um, and I, I'm happy to argue that that's the correct path. So um, I, I, in, a, in a quite extensive paper, I tried to argue with Mark that um, all of the infant looking studies on object and number research is not maybe as powerful as we think, unless you're already a nativist. Um, and with respect to the, the theory of mind stuff, I mean, we're not alone in wanting to argue against object and number, and we're not alone in wanting to reinterpret all of the theory of mind stuff. I'm happy to say all of the theory of mind stuff, some of it is straightforwardly problematic, can't replicate it, for example. Um, others are clearly have confounds, um, and then others require more careful analysis. But I'm, I'm, I think there is enough warrant to suggest that all of that can be reinterpreted in very different ways from how the authors interpret it. Okay, um, I think we can uh, just continue through the break. So if anyone wants to grab a coffee, you can do it while the questions are asked. Uh, so uh, Mark was next. Um, 
No, I, I already said my oh. piece. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, uh, that's great. Okay, uh, so Julie Shaw. No. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for this wonderful conference. And I, this is the first time I've spoken and I wanna introduce myself to you all, not by, not visually at this time, but just with my words. Uh, I find your work to be really, really fascinating and I'm enjoying it a lot. My question for you, uh, Jedediah, is this. So there's a turn with the capacity for reflection at the age of four. This indicate, and you may have done this in your writings and I haven't read them and so I own that. So you have an opportunity to educate me. What is there about reflection that it would become more complex in the future? What are the attributes of reflection that because it does appear that as, as I do, that you believe that there are stage, stage differentiations with development. There isn't just sort of a continuous uh, kind of a thing going on, but there are definite stages. What are the stages you would identify of change with reflection as children get older than age four? Thanks for listening. If it's a question that I'm interested in, if you're interested in answering it. Sure, and my, my answer is just to share with you a little bit of uh, more of the interactivist model, I guess. Um, so Robert Campbell and, and Mark Bickard have a, have a book on the knowing levels, um, and they talk about knowing level three and knowing level four. Um, and as I, I think you're um, suggesting, the, the, the main difference is they're, they're qualitatively new forms of knowing. Um, they're getting to more and more abstract, not necessarily, but in, in many cases, I guess, more and more abstract uh, forms of knowing. Um, and uh, you can talk about it in terms of, of like children's understanding of logic, I think is one of the easiest ways. Uh, children embody a logic and then they have some explicit representing of an aspect of that. And then they have at level two and then they have, you know, some understanding you know, of the necessity of that aspect at level three and then uh, and so on. And so um, again, if Mark, you wanna add something, feel free, but the, the knowing levels model is broader than just uh, level one and level two. Um, uh, but doesn't match up exactly with Piaget. It's like a half cycle different from, from Piaget um, in terms of his, his stages. Thank you. Mark, do you want to add something? Uh, Robert can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, actually Piaget keeps coming up here. Um, first of all, despite Piaget's skepticism about being able to train kids to advance to a higher stage. There is a tale that in the late 1950s, the Geneva, Switzerland public school system started teaching number conservation to kindergartners. Piaget was disgusted <laughs> because from his point of view, it meant that he couldn't do any further assessments of number conservation or more likely studies that incorporated it as part of a larger battery of things in Geneva. So the novelty of the reasoning that Piaget thought he was calling for with it really did matter to him, okay? Um, second thing, um, I mean, we don't, don't have time to unfold all this now, but uh, I'd be curious <clears throat> uh, to see <clears throat> a, critique of Piaget's notion of the semiotic function. Because when you get finished with his sixth stage of, <clears throat> of object permanence, that's roughly where you are. And most of, Piaget's, most of Piaget's attempts to account for language, language development are dependent on that. Uh, in fact, part of the doctrine of the semiotic function is that uh, scooting the eraser along the floor and acting like it's a snail and so on are symbolic actions, okay? Um, none of this helped Piaget at all when he had to debate Noam Chomsky in 1975, and there are, you know, other known difficulties with it, but uh, it's something that might be worth reassessing in general. Um, higher knowing levels. Uh, part of what I've tried to do with them over the years is to show that if you are uh, trying to put together a theory of moral development, or you're trying to put together a theory of some things that are different from but are related to it, like understandings of different 
possible forms of social organization and so on. If, if you can't avail yourself of knowing levels two, three, and four, you're in a jam, okay? There's a lot of stuff you're not going to make sense of, or you're going to end up, uh, you're going to end up like Aristotle over 2,000 years ago telling his students that if they had not already acquired the virtues as habits, they would not profit from a philosophical discussion of the virtues such as the one that he was prepared to offer. Um, the philosophical account of them is in effect at a much higher knowing level than the virtues themselves. Uh, by the way, since we have no more questions, I just want to, I won't go into detail, um, Johanna Sipes, um, but I, I actually think that what you pointed to um, is, is follows within an action-based approach quite well. The idea that the same action is actually understood differently in different situations. And this just goes back to Mark's situation convention because the idea is that, yeah, actions don't have any like, you know, um, foundational meaning. They only have meaning as helping to unfold the interaction in a situation. Um, and so I, I actually have done some work on over imitation where I'm, I'm explicitly arguing that the type of social situation is what's relevant. And I get the kids basically to show, you know, almost 100% over imitation in a, a standard imitation setting. And then I switch it into a helping scenario, the same object, 30 seconds later, and they drop all of the over imitation stuff. And so I, I think it's actually accommodated okay within a action-based framework where there's still no explicit representation of this stuff. It's just um, different social situations and there is no definitive meaning to any action or object or anything. It's always uh, a, an aspect of the, of the broader situation. Okay, we have more questions, uh, comments, uh, but uh, we are out of time right now. So, um, I mean, we have like half a minute until uh, Mugay's talk. Uh, so maybe one last question, uh, Georgi, uh, what's next? Uh, you're muted. Yep. So I guess uh, I was putting the, uh, a question in the chat, but I guess uh, the speakers do not look at the chat. Well, they, 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 it was less intrusive, I, I thought. Anyways, the, the, the question was uh, to Jed, I mean, a brilliant piece of research. Thank you for that. And I was just going to ask, do you have any plans to offer uh, or suggest a, some kind of a computational model of, of uh, what's going on? What's that? Obviously, using the interactive framework. This will be easy. That sounds great. Do you, do you have a, a person in mind to do the computational side of it? <laughs> sure, I can offer you some in the chat. Sounds good. References to that, like some early models of Piagetian like tasks, uh, and based on really simple uh, production rules, you know, no memory, nothing. Uh, it, it, it just, I mean, now I can think of those uh, the production models as uh, implicit presuppositions, yeah, because there is nothing explicit there. And you can just branch them in a way that uh, is constrained by your perceptual input. So that's one thing. And I'll just put a link to another paper of hopefully quite exhaustive models of uh, Piagetian tasks, uh, a, a paper from 2009. I'll just put it in the chat. Thanks. Okay, uh, so let me do this. Uh, Mugay, do you mind uh, uh, waiting a little bit? Because uh, I'm after you, I can yield off some of my time. Uh, I but, don't mind. Uh, okay, so, so uh, Jed, uh, do you want to answer to Gorgi? Oh, no, I mean, I was, I, I guess it was funny too, but I was serious. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that, that sounds great. Um, I, I would probably be a roboticist if I could program myself, but um, I'm not a roboticist. So that tells you something about my, my computer skills. Okay, Mark. I, I just wanted to mention that um, there is a lot of controversy in this realm about how to study and how to understand development in young kids, infants, toddlers, and so on. <coughs> um, part of the 
general problem, or at least a general part of the problem, is what's called rich interpretation, where results in, are interpreted very, very cognitively richly. And this idea of rich interpretation, Jed and I have argued, also plays a role in the very design of the studies. And it, 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 the rich interpretation framework uh, seems to be based on an underlying encoding assumption. It's one that we disagree with. It's one that has to be taken into account. The research quite often has to be done again with proper control conditions because the rich interpretation framework doesn't lead you to even think of uh, appropriate control conditions for non-rich interpretation uh, and, and so on. I mean, I can just go on, a, it's, a, it's a real mess, um, but some of it, we, Jed and I have argued, is a mess that is strongly cognitively constrained by underlying uh, encodingism assumptions. Uh, so in order to answer a lot of these more detailed questions, we would need to do detailed analyses, which we have done in, in a paper with respect to Bayer-Jean and Wynn. Uh, and to some extent, Jed has done with respect to other research as well. But it, it, it's a non-trivial task to figure out what we think is wrong with these things, if we think anything is wrong at all. So that was my comment. Okay, uh, Jorge. Yeah, thank you. Um, I remember vaguely an experiment where you uh, put marbles of different colors in a tube and uh, as then you slant the tube and you ask the child uh, to predict in which order they will come out. But then you flip the tube around, you slant it again and you ask uh, the child the same question. Uh, my question is whether you have some uh, a threshold prediction regarding this experiment or interpretation. So, so Jorge, it's nice, it's nice to meet you. It's uh, fantastic that you said that because that's the Piaget task that Mark has described to me. That was the basis for our candy monster task. So in our candy monster task, you have the tube and you have the three um, balloons. And the idea is the candy monster can only eat from one side of the tube. So we have to turn it around uh, because uh. of course we don't, we don't want these things to become linguistically difficult for the kids. And so we actually, that, that's the task. The, the, the little aspect that I think we added to it that wasn't part of Piaget or Mark's recollection of Piaget was to make the tube transparent. Um, and I think that's actually key because then it becomes Otherwise, it, it's very much like a lot of working memory, classic working memory tasks, I think. So having wow. the transparency, I thought, was like what made it into more of a reflection task. Um, but yeah, that was the basis for it. I see. Yeah. Okay, perfect.